We all dream of the day when the world will end. Each of us has imagined this day in the smallest detail. The day when we will wake up and see roadblocks and anti-tank hedgehogs disappear. The day when we will walk down familiar streets smiling and thank the military who have returned from the front line. When children will smile sincerely again, not waiting for the next air raid. When we forget the words shelling and impact forever. And when the sanctuary points become unnecessary and are closed. We all dream of seeing peaceful life in our peaceful cities and passenger planes in the peaceful skies. When the war is over, Let's be honest, if someone had told us two years ago that we would enter the third year of a full-scale war, most of us would hardly have believed it. A few weeks and we would win, experts said. And this gave us hope and the opportunity to imagine a picture of life after the war. But weeks turned into months. A year of full-scale invasion already seemed like something unbelievable, let alone two. All this time, all our attention was focused on those who protect us and create modern history, the Ukrainian Defense Forces. Together, we rejoiced in the successes of the first year and had ambitious plans for the second year. But unfortunately, the war has nothing to do with experts' predictions. It's a long and extremely difficult work. When will the war end? Frankly, no one in the world can give an accurate answer to this question right now. What will the future look like? Children are the future. They are those who unfortunately already know what war is today, but are not yet able to influence anything. This year we decided to dedicate the episodes of films to the second anniversary of the full-scale war to the children of war. Each of us remembers the stories of our grandparents about the World War II. Some of them were participants in this war, others were children of war. Personally, I remember very well these terrible stories about the occupation, evacuation, loss of loved ones and starvation. Today, unfortunately, modern Ukrainian children have become children of war. And they will tell today's terrible war stories to their grandchildren. How can we make sure that Ukrainian children do not lose their childhood or return childhood to those who are losing it right now? To find out, we came to a special place. The World Inside Out with Dmitro Komarov, Ukraine. Hello, friends! We are in the picturesque, fantastic, beautiful Carpathians. This is a real place of power, where both extreme tourists and those who like to relax will find something interesting. Look, there are such fantastic mountains, rivers and delicious food. I am lucky I've been to the Carpathians dozens of times, but this is a special occasion because we came not to relax, but to introduce you to people who will definitely not leave you indifferent. We are in the village of Osmoloda, ivano frankivsk region. It's located near the Moloda river and the roads are very bad, so it's hard to get here for tourists. However, there are incredible views, silence and most importantly safety. There are not air raids warning here at all. We are now heading towards a summer camp for children. This is a special camp organized during the war, and this shift is also special. There are children behind these doors. We are a surprise for them, they are not expecting us. Hello, everyone! How are you? I have made it to you. Let's get acquainted. Leave. Leave. I watched yours. Let's take acquainted. 
At first glance, the children here are very different, but they all have something in common. What's your name? Andrei. Where are you from? Mariupol. Yaroslava. Where are you from? Mariupol. We watched your show. Thank you very much. What's your name, please? Bogdan. Bogdan. Where are you from? From Bakhmut. Bakhmut. Gleb, from Bucha. Bucha. Some may think that the war is happening only in certain areas, near the front line. In fact, today it is everywhere, and each of these children has seen it personally. I'm Mikita. I'm from Kiev. Mikita from Kiev. What's your name? My name is Kirillo. Where are you from? From Dnipro. Dnipro. Kriviri. You're from Kriviri, and what's your name? Kirillo. And what's your name? Misha. Uman. Misha Uman. What's your name? Sofia. Sofia. Where are you from? From Winnica. My name is Oksana Lebedeva. When the war started, I founded a non-governmental organization that helps children who have lost their parents or experienced traumatic events related to the war. What is the principle of your choosing of children? When we started, we simply gathered children with traumatic experiences of loss, that is, those whose parents died who were direct participants in the events, the most terrible cases. And we collected them everywhere, on Instagram and social media, friends of friends, children, newspapers, journalists. And the children who suffered are everywhere. You ride with them on the bus, in trams, your children go to school with them. You may meet them abroad, because a lot of children there are from Mariupol, from the eastern regions of Ukraine. They play the same way, there is no difference, they are dressed the same way, they have absolutely the same habits as all children. The only difference is that their hearts are completely broken. This camp provides extremely important and serious therapy for children who have experienced terrible losses. I came here to entertain and support the children and try to look at the world through their eyes. You were in Brazil, you were catching crabs. Is it true that a crab bit you? It is. It was painful. And a snake bit you? It's true. You were in China, in Japan, you were in the USA. You were all over the world. Did you watch all the episodes? All the episodes. You have 1,752 videos. I watched them all. 1,752? I didn't even know how many there were. Who has watched The World Inside Out? Raise your hands. Everybody. Everybody! Good, put it down. Then the next question is, is there anyone who hasn't seen the show? Raise your hand. Is there at least one person? How is that possible? Did everyone watch it? Yes. Which country did you like the most? Ukraine. In Odessa. In Odessa? Yes. Do you like Odessa the most? Yes. The girl chose Odessa, she says. Look, now uh, I'm the real Dmitry Komarov visiting you, and we're going to have a great time together. Am I resembling? Yes. You survived altitude sickness in the Himalayas, and you survived a snake. Speaking of snakes, I have a scar, if you don't believe me. You see one tooth, the other tooth, here. Yes, there, I was bitten by a snake in the show World Inside Out, two teeth. And remember this, a frog, when well, they burned my hand with cigarettes. Here is this scar from the frog. It hurts. I don't understand what's going on. I've never felt like this before. Are you immortal? No, 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 not immortal. Who likes presents? Me! And who likes to travel? Me! Uh, who wants to become a real traveler? Me! What should every traveler who goes to the mountains have? A backpack! A backpack, that's right. And what should be in the backpack? What did you say? A flashlight, a knife. What, what did you say? A flashlight, a knife. Well done! For each of you, 
We've prepared a branded The Rolled Inside Out backpack, which contains a minimum set for your first trip to the Carpathians. This is a Rolled Inside Out bottle. No one else in the world will have one, only you. Just for you, a flashlight, a compass. We will learn how to use all this together. Everyone will get a backpack to learn how to travel better. Can you sign it? What? Until the end of the camp. Until the end of the camp, as a counselor? Yes. They want me to stay on as a counselor. Yes! Just for this shift. For the whole shift. For this one. And then you can leave. I'll answer this question when you invite me to spend the whole shift with you. Sometimes, if you manage your time well, you can make one day as eventful, as interesting as a year for other people. Today, we will spend time with these children together. We will share the secrets of survival and just relax. And along the way, we will learn how they live. There cannot be, for example, 10 children in a group who do not speak. It has to be a therapeutic group of the same age, the same trauma, and they should be in a roughly different state. Someone is going through a bad and experience of grief, someone has a slightly lighter feeling after everything, so they should be a different to complement each other. Girls, hi. It's cool that each bed has a sign with a photo and a name. Darina Tarasevich, Eugenia Skripak, the girls always take you to the wardrobe and show you what's in the wardrobe. What a jacket, a golden one! Is it yours? It is. I recognize real girls. Well done, very nice. Glasses. Try it on. Can I try on your jacket? I can only do it like this. Odessa! Look in the mirror, you look great. Of course, we need to be very delicate with children who have experienced enormous stress. That's why we'll be talking under the supervision of the camp's chief psychologist, Oksana. Paulina, tell us about the rules of your room. The first rule is not to make too much noise. The second is not to touch other people's thing without permission. The third is not to sit on someone else's bed. The fourth is not to touch someone else's clothes without permission. Maintain cleanliness. Do not lock people on the balcony. Do not push, do not throw things away. Do not spoil someone's mood. This is very important. Do not go to room 24. Who's in room 24? We have... Boys? No, girls. Girls? So, girls squirrels? Not talk about people? Yes. Let's discuss those in room 24. Let's break the rules. Yes, but this is a violation of the rules. And who invented these rules? We all did. So you created these rules yourself? We did. That's cool. A leaf. This is a leaf. Did you draw a picture on it? What else? Show me, please. What do you have in your treasure box? Chocolates? Cookies? Drawings? This is my first drawing. Thank you. This is my second drawing. This is the third and the fourth. They're yellow and blue. You almost all draw the Ukrainian flag. I look at the drawings and almost all of them have yellow and blue. I wanted everyone to know that this is Ukraine. Is it important that everyone understand that this is Ukraine? Yes. Why? Because some people can speak Russian. Your friend from Odessa speaks Russian and you speak Ukrainian. Do you not quarrel over this? No. Are you friends? Yes. Children are sensitive to language issues. Nowadays, I often come across the fact that small children who are not politicized, who simply perceive this on their own level, somehow are hurt. What to do about it? How to be delicate? I believe that any pressure on children over the language issue is not right. The more pressure we put on children, the more resistance and opposition there will be. My principal position is that I will speak to a traumatized child in the language in which he or she can best express their feelings. If they are in pain and have to find the words to remember what it would be in Ukrainian or Russian, then I lose a 
lot of psychotherapy. That's why it's such a normal rule in general. There are children in the camp who ask, why do you switch to Russian with this child? It is the language of the enemy. I say no. For me, it is the language of this child. My father was the... were... were... where he fought? Yes. Around Bakhmut. He was saving that place when it happened. I forgot which one. Kharkiv? Yes, Kharkiv. There was a very important task there so that the Russians could no longer shoot Kharkiv. He was coming back and they shot him from the back. They killed him. There is a heart in his bag, and that's it. It was in the summer. I understood. You too. Your father is a hero. There were missiles he wanted to get under the infantry fighting vehicle, which is like a tank, but not a tank. He was the most important person there. The commander. And the missile. Did it hit it? I think so. I don't know for sure. I wasn't there. And my father died in Bakhmut. Your father's, your dad's there. Real man. Yes. Real heroes. Yes. Mine was 38. 38. Mine was 28 and I came to see him on his birthday. He died when he was 37. We can hear the slogan, heroes do not die every day today. If a child was a father who was a soldier, and the child hears, heroes do not die, how do they usually react? This is such a beautiful phrase, perhaps, when awards are presented. Society needs it, but unfortunately, their heroes do die. They're personal heroes. And what I see here, and what we all hear, do I need to quote them? He exchanged me for Ukraine. Why did he go there? No, they are dying. But it's just extremely painful for them to hear. Yes, a hero. But why mine? Why mine? I found a lot of photos of my dad on the internet. In memoriam, Volodymyr Tarasevich. I just googled and found them. How are you feeling? In what zone are you? What the zones? Who can tell, Dima? Green is good, it's when everything is calm. Blue is when we are very exhausted. I can show you. All the zones show us the blue one. Start with the blue one. Here is a blue. Okay. Show me the green zone. The green zone is when we're all in a good mood, fulfilling all the tasks. Now show us the yellow zone. That's when she is crazy. Yes. Let's see the red one. Girls. Girls, how do you help someone in the red zone? Let's do it quickly. No, 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 no. We need to hug. We need to hug. To hug. This is exactly how group therapy works. Children learn to help each other overcome emotional crisis and quickly return to having fun. Here. Film me. Film us, come on. Shoot it. Cameraman Darina. Dima, come on. Yes, we have a new operator. Hello. You are watching the world inside out with a new cameraman. What is your name? My name is Dimitro. It's very nice to meet you. I wanted to use my right hand. I know how old are you. You're 40. Yes, I'm 40. And you? I'm nine. How old are we together? Forty-nine. Watch our show and find out the most interesting things. News of Odessa. What is your show called? Word Inside Out. Word Inside Out? Yes, Word Inside Out. Come on, let's eat. Let's go to the restaurant with a microphone. 
We're going down our hallway. Okay, quiet. Take a good shot. Okay, cameraman. Over here. Okay, take the microphone and put it under the short. Like camera. Yeah. I'm going to be a TV presenter. There is a trampoline here and some kind of, I don't know, it's a shack. No one lives there. Let's move on. Don't disturb us. We're filming an interview here. This is our dining room. Hello. Hello. Our counselors are Tim. Nice to meet you. This is Mikhailo. Hello. This is Leosha. This is Nastya. They are eating. Enjoy your meal. Thank you. I'm the host of the TV program World Inside Out. World Inside Out? Yes. The girls have taken on new roles a cameraman and a journalist with a hairbrush. It's the first day of the cameraman. Don't mind her. Do not film this disgrace. Cameraman, come here. She is inexperienced. Hurry up. You were with Word Inside Out. Why are you dropping? Turn the camera off. For Christ's sake. Turn the camera off. That's it. Great. Well done. The children here have a clear routine, just like in a regular camp. Meals five times a day, exercises, games and sections. And the most important thing is communication. Friends, are you filming? Yes. Let's start our training for real travelers. Who's with me? Me! So where does the journey begin? Let's make up a legend. Let's imagine that we are lost in the forest. And by the way, the Carpathians are a really dangerous place where you can easily get lost if the weather is bad. In fact, people get lost every year. Let's imagine that you are lost. What would you do first? Fire. Fire, that's right. If we're really in the forest, we have to find a place where we don't start a wildfire. That is not close to other trees, not where the grass is dry. This is a civilized place, so it's better not to spoil the grass. Take a grill. The wood must be dry, not moist. And chips. You need chips. You can make chips. Come on, make some. Clever! Who has done this before? Who's made a fire before? I haven't done it in the forest. Not in the forest. Who can do it with a spark? I can. You can? I can do it with stones. Can you even do it stone to stone? Who is brave enough? Come here. I see a girl who can help us. Come here. Milana and her brother came to us through Ahmadid. We cooperate with various organizations. She was undergoing physical rehabilitation there because she was very injured. She was saved by the doctors. What happened to her? There was a private sector impact and her mother died in front of her. Her aunt was wounded and she was very injured by the fragments. Now she and her brother are undergoing rehabilitation with us. To be honest, I've never seen such love as they have. It's something incredible. I take my hat off. Who wants to borrow it? Me! Give it to me! Borrow, not to give! Let's do it for a question. What is the height of the highest peak in Ukraine? How far long? 2060 meters. You were the first. Yes. Come here. <laughs> my name is Maxim. I'm from Yumen. I lived there all my life and still do, even after what happened. And what happened if she don't mind me asking? Yes, we were living a quiet life. On the 27th, we came home in the evening and we are on the sixth floor. We went upstairs and my mother said her last words, do you want to spend the night at my place tonight? I live with my grandparents and my mother lived in the apartment next door. So you literally went out into the vestibule, walked two meters and you were already in my mother's apartment. So there are two apartments on the same floor. Yes, very close. It's a nine-story building. 
Yes, a nine-story building we lived on the sixth floor. Then I said no for some reason. I decided so and said goodbye. And then I had this insomnia. I didn't sleep until about 3 a.m. But then I just went to sleep. I woke up because I was breathing in smoke. Not from the sound of the explosion, not from anything, but just from the smoke. The first thing I picked up was an icon that was lying on the floor. It was a small icon about this size. In the room, I saw that the glass was broken, and I was wondering what had happened. Something happened. I didn't know what. Didn't you realize it was impact? No, I didn't realize it at all. I was breathing in the smoke, thinking maybe there was a fire. I asked my grandfather what happened. What should we do? My grandfather said, we had impact. That's what my grandfather said. We got out, and the last thing I did was to shout, Mom, get out! I shouted. Grandpa shouted some more, Svidlana. That was my mom's name. Since we didn't know what could happen, whether the house would collapse or something else, we went downstairs. The fire was so intense that I couldn't see what happened to the apartment. But when the smoke started to rise, I realized that the entrance and one part of the entrance were gone. It was like a light in my heart went out, you know. There was such an emptiness in the moment. I just realized that there's probably nothing there anymore in this apartment. The realization came when my aunt called me and said that they had found my mother dead. I didn't believe it. I went to the house, stood in front of the house for about half an hour and that moment. I turned around and could not realize it for a long time anyway. It was such an emptiness. Somehow I tried to continue living because I know that my mother would tell me to continue living. Because I know my mother's answer to this question. And I tried to do everything to make my mother look down on me and be happy. I was impressed that the boy remembers the smallest details of that fatal day. This is another reminder that every missile fired, every mine exploded remains forever in the hearts of our children. Whenever I remember moments with my mother, I'm happy, but, well, there's pain. I'm glad that I spent time with my mother in a good way, but the pain is inside of me. My deepest condolences to you, the deepest ones. It's just terrible. Let's get the flint. Let's try it. It's even better if you have some paper in addition to the flint when you get lost. For example, Alexander gave me a napkin. Just a napkin. I can try it. Okay. It won't work. Whoever succeeds will get a surprise from us. The paper. May I? The girl wants to. Can we let the girl try? The other side with the prongs. There is a rain cloud. We have to hurry. We have to make it before it rains. Come on. We have work to do. If it rains, we'll get wet and freeze, and that's it. Alexander! 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 Alexander, wow! Got it! Now we're fanning it out. Now that we've lit the fire, what do we need to do next? We need meat and kebabs. Kebabs. We need to know where we are. To do this, we need what? A compass. Do you have one? Yes. Take it out. 
we look at where the north is, where the south is, and so we can always find our way. How do you find north and south in the forest? Moss grows. Moss. Let's go to the nearest tree and see if it's true or not. You think it is, don't you? And these are also growth, so... So you think it's north, approximately? Well, approximately, because I looked at the compass. And the compass matches, so you can navigate. Yes, help me. Another very reliable way if you get lost. You just look for any river and just go downstream. The current will definitely lead to some settlements. My friends got lost when they were skiing in the Carpathians and they spent two days walking in the Carpathians. But they just walked along the river and came to the foresters. This is Alexander Dmitriev's backpack. So he's showing us how to set up a tent. Alexander's tent. The tent consists of poles, a awning, and a tent. Usually, in hiking, someone helps someone else. Can someone help? Me, me, me. Come on. The children were very happy to help Alexander set up the tent. With so many helpers, we managed to do it very quickly. The tent is set up. An experiment how many people can fit in it. We're going to count how many of us will come in. One, two, three, four. That's the fifth. Six, seven, twelve, thirteen. You're the fourteenth. You see, it's a three-person tent, and there's already 16 people in it. Will you be the 17th? Come on. I'm 18. 18. Come on. 19. I'm going 20. There's room for five more. 21, 22. Come on. 23. Getting close. It's still possible. Come on. We'll set a record. 24. Now we can get out. A new record is set. 25 people in one tent. It's starting to rain. It's raining. Let's pause our training for a while and go to your room, shall we? And then we'll continue after the rain. To 32. Did you ask to borrow my hat? Can I borrow yours? Yes. Mine's from Laos. And yours? Mine was a gift from my dad. Dad's? Yes. Very nice. It was only a few minutes later in the room that took me to that I realized what had actually just happened. I'm supposed to have a session with a psychologist. You've arrived. How can I miss such a guest? I'm seeing my idol for the first time. Pleasure. You say you have a meeting with a psychologist. And what do you talk about? You, for example. For example, we talk about nature, about hunting, because my father was a hunter. Your father died? Yes. He was killed by the flamethrower system. According to my mother, she went to pick him up from the morgue and he was all burned. His face was burned. He was a machine gunner. Where did this happen? It happened in Bakhmut, Solidar, Bakhmut district. How long ago? May 16, a year ago. Horrible. My condolences. You said it was your dad's hat. It's very important to you. Oh, I'm sorry I took it like that. It's okay. Here we go. Did your father give it to you? Yes. When people don't talk about the terrible grief they have experienced, do not recall, do not stir up these painful memories, what does this lead to? It leads to the preservation of traumatic experiences. That's you need to talk about grief, you need to cry. Yes. You need to unpack this trauma with the child. You have to bring out that pain, talk to them about it, work through it, and make sure they don't avoid it. That is, if a child says that this did not happen to me because they are often repeat that it was like a dream, it may not have been true, 
And now many say that it's not my dad in the coffin because they didn't see him, because they deny their memories. Our goal is to combine these traumatic memories of the past with the present and project the future. And their mental health will be healed if they see themselves in the future. How old was your dad? My dad would have been 43 on October the 12th. He was very nice. Such a desert man, he was big, he even used to bend nails into eight. He was a machine gunner, you know what that is. It's a machine gun of caliber 27. He took a picture with a machine gun looking so serious. Physical pain is the kind of pain you have to avoid. It's hard, don't touch it. But emotional pain is the kind of pain you have to meet. It's mandatory. You have to face it and get over it. Do you remember how the war came to your town and how you realized that the war had begun? Did you realize at once that it was war and what it was? We immediately thought fireworks, I wake up, my mom was frantic. I thought, what are those cans? Some canned food. What is it? What is happening? And I hear a piece of shrapnel flying over the house. We were there for 10 days in Kharkiv. We were running to the toilet all the time because of the stress. My mom, dad and me were shaking. They were worried the most about me. When your dad was already in the world, did you write to him or call him all the time? Yes, I've been in touch. I regret that I didn't pick up the phone at the last moment on May 15th. I still regret to this day that I couldn't, that I didn't pick up the phone I was playing. My mom called me, my dad said, it's okay, it's okay, let him play. And on the 16th of May at 10.25, uncle, uncle Vava called his brother. There were six of them in the family and now there are five. Dad's brother says that I no longer have a father. I got hysterical, I started screaming. Dad was my best friend, very close to me. And when he was gone, I immediately realized that he was gone. I didn't cry at the cemetery. I followed the car where my father's coffin was laying. It was green and covered with a yellow and blue flag. I noticed from talking to some of the kids that they're quite grown up for their age. The way they think, the way they formulate their thoughts. What will you do when you grow up? What are your plans? I used to want to... I thought I'd avenge my dad. And then I think, why, for example, as I suffer for my dad, I don't want my son or wife to suffer. Well, my mom and I were behind my dad like a stone wall. Here. Yeah. Mom cries all the time, I comfort her. Mom's in Krasnograd now at my grandmother's. You see an 11-year-old boy, but you feel you're talking to a 30-year-old one. Why is that? In psychology, we call it re-identification. When the family hierarchy changes and the child seems to become a father or mother to the remaining adult, for example, a boy feels a lot of responsibility. In children, this happens in the following way. They stop doing what they were supposed to do. They cannot study. They think about their mother all the time. Very often, they don't want to go to the camp because they say, I can't leave my mother. We have financial problems. We have to solve them. But the child is 10 years old. He cannot solve financial problems yet. You have to appreciate your loved ones while you have them. Loved ones are ready to believe in everything to protect you, always and everywhere, to support you always. You have to pick up the phone while they are there. That's what I realized.
children. Those parents died. Some of them blamed themselves that if I had answered the phone, if I had gone to my mother's, if I hadn't asked her to go somewhere, this would not have happened. Why them and not me, the children say. The feeling of guilt is generally characteristic of everyone who has lost someone. How do we deal with it? We normalize it. Dad died not because he quarreled, but because enemies came to our land and they are killing. That is, we return this guilt to those who are really guilty. It is very important for children to realize this. Dad would definitely be very proud of you, and I'm sure he's proud of you there. You're a very strong man. I really mean it. The child realized that this was the lie for him, and he said that it was just scary, that only terrible things happened, that his father died, that there was no future, that he could not imagine how I would live tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, and now he realizes that good things can happen, that he can meet Komaro, just meet him, talk to him, hug him, and life is not so terrible, good things will happen. Hey, mom, can you see me? Look, mom, this is a gift for you. A friend of ours. We made friends with him today. Hello. Come around. Cool. Congratulations. A dream come true. You have a very cool son, very mature, real man, very brave, very smart. I would say you raised him right. We can say a big thank you for such a son, because such children are the future of Ukraine. Have a good evening. Thank you. Goodbye. All the best. Son, I love you. Are you happy? Are you very happy? Yes, thank you. Thank you. The rain is over, and the kids and I continue to learn how to be travelers. We continue our training, and I pass the baton to whom? To Alexander! To Alexander! And Alexander will now teach you as a professional climber a very important skill, how to tie knots. Do you know how to tie knots? There is a rope. Show me how you can do it. You tied this one, right? And now we're going to invite our security expert, Alexander Dmitriev. Tell me, is this right or wrong? There are many different knots, maritime and tourist. I will show you the most basic ones that I use. The most popular and simple knot is called a straight knot. It's tied like this. It starts simply as usual, as you tie the laces, and then repeat the movements of the opposite rope. And you get this knot. Give us an example. Show us how to rescue ourselves, for example. Let's try it. Now we have a girl named Toma in this camp. She is from Mariupol, and her father is He's a legendary warrior with the call sun Celt. He died in Mariupol at Azovstal. And put this hand, leave this hand, pull your hand out, you see, it works. So you can easily escape. Yes. His contract has already expired. He lived with his family in Slovakia, and when the full-scale invasion began, he was in Ukraine the next day. He was in that very operation when the first helicopters flew to Azovstal with help and medicine. And Toma has this incredible painting. She calls these helicopters angels, carrying aid to Azovstal. So he stepped into Azovstal, took one photo with Redis, sent it to his wife, and she just lay down because she hadn't sent him from Slovakia to Azovstal. She didn't know, he didn't warn her, and she saw this photo and was very scared, but the next day he died from a piece of shrapnel in his heart. He died, there were no news for three months, they were looking for his body, and his body was returned. His wife recognized him by his tattoos. 
So the child stayed in Slovakia at school where there was constant bullying because she was Ukrainian. What kind of bullying is this? The children, she had an Azerbaijani friend who constantly said that Russia is a cool country, Russia go ahead. In therapy she made a discovery about why my father broke away from home and went, chose such a dangerous special operation, even though he shouldn't have been there for health reasons, but he couldn't leave his brothers and chose the most terrifying path, that is, he left, flew to the special operations, and she didn't understand how all these people were fleeing the country, sitting in McDonald's with their children, in restaurants where they go with their mother, and they couldn't afford anything there because their father left them and went to war. Oksana said that children ask why their fathers went to war and died, while someone else's fathers are somewhere abroad at the same time. I am an adult man. I'm not blaming anyone, but children ask this question, right? Is it only children? Adults also ask such questions. And you know, this is a big problem that we will still face, the division into our own and strangers, the division into those who were there and those who were not. We will still have to solve this problem because it already exists. I I always say that it is important for children to hear that what your father did was the choice of real man. Your father did not think it possible to sit on the couch when you, your mother, your family, your home, our land were under threat. How do you approach it correctly? Because it's a very sensitive topic. Children during the war, they have a lot of questions that we adults don't have answers to. Or let's say that most adults have no answers. I have even heard from my friends that it's difficult to answer such simple but very difficult questions to a child. Mom, Dad, why did they attack us? The answer depends on the age of the child. If the child is young and does not yet go to school, then you need to tell them in a way that they will understand. For example, it happens that someone wants to take your toy. It is not good to encroach on other people's things. That's why your enemies really came to take our land, our houses, our things, our people. And this is a very clear question for a child. Okay, mom, dad, should we give them our toys or not? Are we going to give them up or not? That's what we say, that's what we do. That is, we tell our children the truth. We're not giving them up, and our armed forces are defending us now. Fighting Ukrainians have risen up and are defending their lands. We need to tell it like it is. Mom, Dad, tell me, will we live? We will live. And they're killing us. Can they kill us? This is probably the most difficult question, because nowadays a lot of children have a fear of death. In children of about five or six years of age, this fear of death is age-related. That is, it appears in connection with development, and it is not very intense. They understand what death is. They are beginning to understand what death is. Dad, why is there a war? No one needs war. We have to respond. But there are people who want to rob ours. That's why the war is happening. We definitely do not need it. But we must resist. Children have to ask questions, and we have to answer these questions in a way that the child can understand. And what if the same questions are asked by older children? We tell it like it is. We can speak in a more adult language. We can explain what we think about it. I try to explain what happened in adult language without giving too many details. And sometimes it's better to ask the child what you know and think about it and hear what the child says. Children sometimes say strange things. You know, I have a boy, though a younger one, five years old from Bucha. He said, do you know why the war started? Because we lived very well. My family lived very well. Remember what caused your disappointments and worries before the full-scale war. Usually it was some insignificant everyday family or work-related trifles. The war changed the perception of life, and most of us realized how well we had lived before. The war helps you realize that the most important moment in your life is right now. It's right here, and this moment will never happen again. So if you have a reason to be happy or smile even during the war, don't lose it. 
This advice is relevant not only for children. Is it poisonous if it has a yellow belly? It's not poisonous for sure. Look what kind it is. Just don't hurt it. You can pat it. You can eat it. But you can't torture it. Let's eat it. No, don't. Take pity on it. To take pity on it? Okay. I touched a frog today, too. A frog? Stop, just look. Let me touch it. Go away. Where is the balance? On the other hand, we have to run to an underground shelter every day. And on the other hand, we want the child to grow up healthy and with a normal mental health so as not to traumatize them. How to reconcile this? I mean, where is that balance? The balance depends on our state of mind. If we go to the shelter with a child, we can take with us not gadgets where we sit reading the news and the child sits reading the news or playing. Staying in the shelter can be turned into a time that we spend together. A lot of hugs, tactile contact, enduring anxiety. The feeling of closeness with a strong person is important for everyone, not just children. For example, when we squeeze the child like this, not with our fingers, but with our palm, it gives them the feeling that I'm there. And this is usually very calming. So we hold the child like this and squeeze everything so well with our palms. You can say that the best method is to use the air raid other time in the shelter to communicate, read, play, and not talk about missiles or war, about anything else. Only answer the questions. If a child asks, you have to answer, because if we avoid answering, the child's anxiety increases. You know, he thinks either there is something wrong with me or with my parents, they do not test reality. So if we run away from fear, it catches up with us. We teach our children this way. In order to prevent it from catching up with us, we need to make our own rules, turn around and look him in the eye. When we have children, we are responsible not only for ourselves, we make decisions, but children do not make decisions. They are hostages of our decisions. And going to a safe place and teaching children safe behavior is the only thing we can really do now. Guys, that's it. We're not letting Kamarov go. So that I don't live here? Yeah, that's it. You're my pet. A pet? Yes. Where should I go? The kids are having a good time. Camaro has been captured. No, it's not Camaro. It's captured Camaro. We show them the correct knots to our own misfortune. They tied our hands and led us off. Our room? How cruel you are. You will sleep here instead of Igor. That's it. You will live with us instead of Igor. All right, can you untie me now so that I can continue to live with you freely? Good. Well, I'm staying with you now. There are several activities going on in parallel. While some children are resting in their rooms, others are painting in the art studio. Darwin is a very simple and ordinary thing for all of us, but it's extremely useful. We have an art studio here and children paint here. Anyone who wants to. They really like this activity. We are planning to organize an exhibition later. Darwin is useful. Very useful. Makeda, what are you painting? Just a lantern. It has a candle inside. Yes. Can you tell us your story, how you ended up here? On December 31st, a missile hit our house. Where in Kiev? Yes, in Kiev. Which neighborhood? Dokuchaevska. You were celebrating the new year? No, we were getting ready. It was at the beginning of the day. My my mother was preparing everything at 12.46 or 12.36, I don't remember. 
What do you remember about that day? I woke up, I was sick, and I went to a gargoyle, took some pills. My mom gave it to me there. Then I went to my room. My dad and I were watching TV. There was something about history, about Tesla on TV. And then it happened later. It was at the beginning of the day. There was an impact on their house and his mom died. She went to the kitchen and he asked her to go into the kitchen. Most of all, I remember when I came out, there was... how, how to say it? I just don't know how to explain. There was an emptiness right from our street. There was no road, only dirt and fire. Half of the house was gone. I just didn't understand what happened. That is, you heard the air raid alert that you had to go to the shelter. Yes, but at the time, if there was a siren, there were no sound of explosions at all. The siren was going on for two hours and nothing. And you got used to it? Yes, and then it was unexpected. The very first one just hit us. Then they picked me up and carried me to the bench to sit down. Is it hard for you to talk about it now? Not really, it just makes me sad. But we know that we need to talk about it in order not to accumulate it, not to preserve it. We've already talked about a lot of things here. You mean we need to talk about this pain, about such a strong pain? Yes. For him, it's just a very fresh story, because it hasn't even been six months, and he's going through it very hard. He and his mom were very close. Grieving is normal, but this thing that he asked her, you know, it all happens in minutes. He asked her to get something from the kitchen. Somehow something happened there, and his mom left and never came back. Who do you live with now? We live with my dad now. Do you ever visit your mom? Yes, once, because she was buried in her hometown in Chernihiv. We visited her only once. Is there a photo of her at home? There is a photo of my mother at home, but it's just a printed one, because my mother has very few photos of her at full length. She took more photos of my dad and me. What did your mom teach you and that was good and beautiful? That you shouldn't be afraid to make a mistake. Yes. And if you do make a mistake, you can take it as an example and do something new, which will be better. You are very strong. You are very strong. We see how you hold yourself back. Joe, Joe, sorry that we disturbed you. Thank you. Thank you. You're doing great. Every shift, a child comes here who just tears me up. For example, there are 50 kids right now. This boy, Misha from Uman, was especially difficult for me. Here is something Misha drew. Tell me, please, is this the Carpathians? It is. Are those mountains? Yes. The family that came from Luhansk to Uman because they were fleeing the war. And on the 28th of April, Misha's older sister and older brother were killed in a missile attack on their house. How old were they? 11 and 17 years old. The parents and Misha survived. This is the sun. The sun? A grass. Grass? Yes. A tree. A tree? I don't remember what kind. Spruce. Rain. Is it rain? And what's down there? Those are... Roots. Tree roots. How long have you been painting this? How old are you? I'm six, almost seven. It's beautiful. Well done. By a miracle, two children who lived in the same house, in the same stairwell, met in the same camp, and on the same day, each of them lost part of their family. Misha was a kid from the eighth floor. He was the one who lost his brother and sister. We met, I told him, we will be together. 
And such cases are not rare. Unfortunately, every missile that hits a civilian building means dozens of injured children and adults. What helped him survive? The chance. A chance, Dmitro. I had a girl of 13. She slept in the same room with her parents in the Kharkiv region. Once there was an impact on their house, everyone died. Even the animals, both mom and dad, but the child was thrown 50 meters away by the blast to a neighbor's house and covered with a sofa. She survived. She survived. It's enough to look at the drawings to understand what acute pain our children are going through. That is why psychologists advise parents to look closely at the children's art in order to notice warning signs in time. Yes, they draw it. We have special notebooks with a lot of questions. What did you feel? How do you feel? If you can't talk, you can draw. And they can cry at this time. You can do anything here. If you want to be aggressive, to hit, there are punching bags. If you want to yell, go yell. You can do anything in a socially acceptable way. If it doesn't hurt other children, you are allowed to do anything. There are a lot of interesting things going on here at the same time. Right now, kids are painted in here. In another part, there's a master class, some group classes are going on, and kids are playing sports. Everything is mixed up. We're going off. You can't even imagine how many different activities there are here. One of them is the French method of tomatis therapy. To put it very simply, after psychological trauma, it becomes difficult for a person to concentrate, focus and absorb information. For a child who has to absorb new knowledge every day, this is very dangerous. Tomatis is like a gym for the brain, where various, so to speak, simulators train the brain and the effect of stress on it becomes less noticeable. The technique itself consists of listening to Mozart music in special headphones. The music is recorded in such a way that high notes alternate very sharply with low ones, quiet sounds with loud ones, and the brain is constantly surprised. Also, the music passes through the headphones, not only into the ears, but also through the special bell vibrator directly into the cerebral cortex. These are the headphones. This happens for two hours. So they coordinate their movements and balance while listening to Mozart. They touch this ball and balance on the board. They have a rest. You can sleep during tomatis. You can read, you can draw. But the girl meditates. She seems to fall asleep near the radiator. Yes, sometimes they sleep. The guys are chilling on the couch. Some of them are even reading. Yes. You have a lot of freedom, so you can spend your time as you want, right? Yes. I would like to say once again to our mothers, fathers, those who have experienced these terrible, traumatic events and for whom there is no end to it. Everything continues. Please, seek help. It is not a shame. We have a lot of mental stigma about mental health services. Please, think about the children. If it is difficult for you to go for help yourself, think about them. It will definitely affect their entire future. There will definitely be some problems, and you will see it not today, tomorrow, but in 10 years. It is better to turn to specialists now. There is no shame in going to a psychologist. How do you plan the schedule of a child who has experienced very terrible emotions and stress? In fact, our day is based on a normal family situation. We wake up, we wake up our children, we know how to wake them up, who needs to scratch their back, who needs to do some stretching. We have exercises that everyone can do at home. We have a strict schedule. In general, it is very important when we are going through difficult times to have a strict schedule. When there is anxiety, we have to plan. These tips are useful for all Ukrainian children without exception, regardless of whether they live in the frontline regions, in the remote area or even abroad. We go to a place where children swim after cardio, they had an exercises routine, and afterwards they like to jump into the lake. The two of us, Bogdan and I, are on the right, you're on the left, okay? Come on, go back a little bit, speed up, speed up, just don't fall. 
Let's go! Next, next! Next! Just a healthy life. Sports, swimming, socializing. Friends, Boda has just learned to swim. Bogdan. He was eight years old when his parents died in Bakhmut. His father and mother, his mom was pregnant seven months, I think. It's terrible. I know you're from Bakhmut, right? Tell me about Bakhmut. I didn't have time to visit it when it was possible. I didn't. It was cool in Bakhmut. There was a lot of stuff there. I knew how to go to the kindergarten. I knew where the market was, how to go to the market. Do you miss the city? Yes, very much. Did you have friends in Bakhmut? Yes, a lot of them. Did you manage to take some things with you? Photos? What's in the photo? The photo shows me dressed in a hat, jacket and pants. With dog? I saw this photo of Boda and immediately fell in love with Boda with his blue eyes. They came to him and told him, get dressed, they are probably going to take you to the orphanage now. Your mom and dad died. He didn't believe it. Stole a bicycle? And you went to your house? No, they didn't die at home, they died on a bridge. There is a bridge, there is the path, they crossed the bridge and there they laid. He went to the battlefield where, as he understood, that his father's or mother's corpse should be. I went to the place where it all happened. I went there. I was crying even when I was driving. Were you scared? Yes. Did he not believe that the worst had happened? No, I didn't. Only when you saw it, right? Yes. When he came and saw them, he fell down. He said, you know, I came there, I saw their arms, legs, stomachs were turned off. And I looked at my father, but I couldn't look at my mother. He couldn't clearly see that it was his father, that it was his body, but he couldn't look at his mother. So he walked away. I looked and saw my mom lying with my dad. I realized that they had already died. He saw her lying there, he saw everything, but he just didn't look at her closely. He is a child. He was there alone on the fire for a day. They were shooting all the time. It turned out that it was a war zone from which it was simply impossible to get anyone out, and the police could not get there for a whole day. He was there alone. Where were you lying? I was on the field. It was around the field and nothing else there. It was like a god was protecting me. I looked and something was flying, something yellow, and it was... it was flying fast. He stayed there near them. He just moved away and found some shelter somewhere. It was still October, so he found some shelter. How did you find a place to sleep? I just went there. I was there. I knew these places, of course. I know almost all of Bakhmut. How many nights did you spend on your own? One, one night. Did God protect you? Does he know? Yes. You have a side for this, you told me. For bad dreams, remember? I always dreamt that my mother's hand was like this, bloody. I remember you told me. How did you cope with it? I just didn't think about it, that's all. How did you learn not to think about it? I just forgot about it, that's all. All right, you don't want to tell me. Only during the break between Shell and did the police manage to pick up Bogdan and take him to a safe place. He had nightmares for a very long time about the hand he was talking about. With the blood on it? Yes, his mother's hand. He said that the war had taken his mother away, cried and asked his mother to take him away too. He made a shield over his bed to protect him from nightmares, because he had nightmares all the time. He drew it, cut it out, and there was blood, there was measles. He hunted over his bed, and then he was protected by a smile, the sky and the Ukrainian flag he drew with himself. May I ask you, tell me please about your parents. My dad... You can tell, but you don't have to. I don't know who my father was. An ordinary man. 
mom. And your mom? My mom used to read me books. Do you like listening books? Yes. He's nine years old. He does not know yet how to write and read. He came to us right after he was taken away. The question of where and with whom he would live had not yet been resolved, so we had to work with acute stress. At this time, children are not taught to read and write. We will learn to read by the end of the camp. For what? To be smart. To read normally, so that I won't be called a knob. Called what? A knob. What's that? Knob. Knob means stupid in games. So you learn to swim, now you want to learn to read properly. How old are you? I'm nine. Did you go to school in Bakhmut? In Bakhmut, yes. The war takes away the opportunity to learn from our children. Unfortunately, Bogdan, who is his age, should have already started third grade, lost two years and did not even master the first grade curriculum. Bogdan, what do you dream about in general, if you can imagine your future profession? I want to become a military man. Okay, and what would you like to achieve? What would you do? To transport weapons, to help them transport missiles. There is a lot of stuff to transport ammunition, to shoot Russians. To shoot Russians. Shoot Russians. Is it possible to somehow neutralize these consequences? Or will they accompany you all your life? It is impossible to neutralize it, because there are things we cannot forget. But you know, in working with fear, it is very important to go through several stages. The first is to accept what happened, and Boda has already done that. And the second is to work through difficult feelings, to accept your feelings, which is also very important because sometimes children say, I have become abnormal. We normalize and say, you know, your anger, your hatred and your fears are normal reactions to abnormal events, because what is happening to us is abnormal. I think we can go to dinner now. Shall we go to dinner? Let's go to dinner. You're starting to fall asleep. I wasn't falling asleep, I was laying down. Are you warm? I am. Now we are doing everything possible to somehow improve his situation because he was taken away not even by relatives, but by extremely distant friends or family. A child who has experienced such traumatic events needs a lot of love. He needs so much love to overcome all this. Bodia is looking for mom. He approaches the women and he checks. He calls them mom and looks at the reaction. So now we need to decide on Bodia's future. I really dream that he will find a family that can give him education, care and love. He is a very warm child. Does he need foster care the most because he is a complete orphan? Yes, he is a complete orphan. Unfortunately, there are many children here who have been made complete orphans by the war, and it's very important to teach them not to lose their ability to enjoy life. We see that children have parties every day, they sing, they have karaoke. But today, if many people see this, they will condemn it. They will say, why do they dance during the war? Why do they sing karaoke during the war? Why do they have entertainment during the war? But they're children and they want to dance, they want to sing. How do you balance this, not offend anyone and still let children be children without violating wartime ethics? If children in cities and towns stop laughing, having fun, playing and growing, then we have unfortunately already lost. I talk a lot with the guys who are now on the front line near Bakhmut or in the Zaporizhia direction, and they say that children should laugh, children should have fun, children should have a normal childhood, and we here have to ensure this, and you there please ensure it. That is, on the front line they have their own throne, and if a child is skateboarding and listen to music in the city center, they have to do it, and I'm very grateful that they can do it. That is why we have to ensure that children have a normal childhood during the war. This is a game, fun, bicycles, skateboards, good time that they can spend with their families. Communication, children's laughter. Communication, laughter, God, we need it so much. If children stop laughing during the war, then what are we fighting for? Even if children lost their parents during the war, they have to dance. 
Have fun, laugh, be silly, because this is childhood. And if we want to take away this childhood from them, we will do it faster than our enemies by the actions of adults who forbid it. I say this as a person, as a mother, as a grandmother, and as a professional. You know, we often say about our camp that, that we will win back our children from the war. They are actually preventing our future from being bright. They want us to have a generation of depressed, nervous, grieving children. And we want a generation of cheerful children who know how to be happy. I think the best antidepressant is love. Yes. Children have to live their childhood. After all, we all struggle and fight, and their parents died so that they could have this childhood. Do you know what mothers used to do with their children in the drama theater? They told me that they did puppet theater, played with them. They tried to preserve their childhood even there, in the basement of the Mariupol Drama Theater. Children have to leave their childhood now, and what we are doing is to preserve it for them, because we will not have any other time. Childhood does not come back. There has to be a balance. One boy did not go to the party during all this time, and I talked to him then. Savelli said, my dad died, our troops are fighting, our guys are in the trenches, in the mud up to their knees, and here they have a party. He is 10 years old, but he seemed to me more of a man than many of my friends. When we talk about this, we explained, we explained a lot. We have hours of remembrance, we constantly remember it, we constantly talk about your parents, we are grateful to them, but here and now you are in an environment where you can enjoy life a little bit. Just a little bit. I also want to cheer up the children. So tonight we have a travel gastro evening. Good evening again, everyone. Good evening. What do you think we're going to cook? Corn. Corn porridge. We're in the Carpathians, and this is the most famous Hutzel Carpathian dish. It's Benish corn porridge with sour cream and, in our case, with bacon. Will you help me? Yes. Let's do it. I'll put some water on first. Memorize the recipe. You'll need it later. You'll like it. First of all, we prepare the water, and I would also throw in some firewood. Do you even know why banish is cooked over an open fire and not indoors as usual? Yes. Why? If banish isn't cooked over an open fire, it's not a banish, it's some kind of kulebiaka. Kulebiaka. This way there will be a flavor of smoke and it will be a real banish. How did you come up with the idea to do this? I remember how I was getting to my son when the war started, I was not in Ukraine but in America, and I will never forget these four days, they changed me a lot. I was traveling in this state on the train from Warsaw to Kyiv and the battle for Kyiv was going on, and he kept calling me and saying, Mom, what should we do? Me and grandmother here? What if they come here? Give me some advice. And it was the most horrible thing I've ever experienced in my life. They were children, their children suffered, and it became very personal for me. Who among you can remember your 24th of February? in 2022. Who wants to remember? My mom woke me up at 5 a.m. and her first words were, the war has begun. I heard fireworks in the morning. My mom heard it and quickly started packing. I didn't understand what was happening. I asked my mom, what is it? Are these just fireworks? And she said, the war has started. I thought, is it was fireworks or the war has started? I heard that and I thought it was not fireworks at all. When I saw Bucha with all these photos, you know, when children lie in columns on top of each other, killed, raped or maimed, that was the point of no return. And professionally, I already know, I learned later that this is called witness trauma, which is, I'm sure, we all have. What is witness trauma? Witness trauma is when you experience a traumatic and tragic events as if you were a participant in it, even though you were not. You just saw and felt it. You tell these terrible things and I see that life goes on in parallel. You see, we're talking about war, but fortunately life goes on. Is the water boiling? 
Yeah. Then we pour in the corn grits and wait for it to boil. And who will help me make cracklings? May I? Come on, my friend, come over. Half for you, half for me. Won't you cut your fingers? No. Are you sure? I'm sure. Come on, let's just cut the pad back. We can make cracklings. Who wants to cook a piece of fat back for themselves? Me. If you don't have a skewer, take a stick like our friend did. Give me Ukrainian fat back. Do you like fat back? Yes. Of course, I don't really like it raw, but when you fry it... My friends, do you like the process? Yes. Do you have an appetite? You feel a little bit of stomach churning? Yes. Okay, kids, who made the fat back? Kids, whoever made the fat back, bring it over here. It's almost all gone. Did you eat it? Why? You see, real Ukrainians, I asked them to help me fry the fat back, and they fried it and ate it. I didn't eat it. You were the only one who didn't. You should always expect surprises from children. The children ate the fat back while we were frying it. Only pork was left. That's why our banish will be with a kebab today. However, no one seems to be upset about it. You asked for it. All right, it's starting to boil. We pour in the sour cream and everything is almost ready. Do we stir it? Yes! It's the first time in the world that we're going to make banish like this because usually cracklings are small, tiny, and we're making big ones here. We're just going to have this wild Carpathian Highland banish. Not simple, not classical, not restaurant one, but real mountain banish. So, how are you feeling? Good! Good, are you hungry? Yes! I'm hungry as a bull! One minute's notice, everyone! My friends, the banish is ready! Come on, bite into it! Yeah, careful! I have cooked banish many times, but today I have a particularly responsible mission because it's one thing to feel this traditional Ukrainian dish to Chinese and Pakistan tribesmen who have never tasted Ukrainian cuisine in their lives, and quite another to please Ukrainian children who have fed similar foods every day. This is probably the first time I've even been so scared that a dish won't be appreciated. Let me taste how it came out. I'll tell you if it's tasty or not. It's delicious. It's a real banish. You cook very well, it's true. I want you to become a chef. A chef? Why aren't you a chef? Why not a chef? Yes. Because I'm a journalist, not a chef. What moment of happiness does each of you dream of? Can we say one at a time? That there would never be a war again. I want Ukraine to win. I want all the cities to be rebuilt exactly as they were. My biggest dream, which unfortunately will not come true, is to see my father. My dream is to see all my family and friends who are abroad and whom I could not see before. I dream that there will be no more war. And what does little Misha dream about? Victory. Victory. If I could address the children, I would tell them if they have classmates at school whose dad or mom died, or they were injured, or they are displaced, or they are from the deoccupied territories. These children find shelter in your schools, in your cities. Please invite them to visit. Become their friend. Open your heart to them. Let your family somehow become theirs. Don't offend them, because especially in peaceful cities where there is no war, especially such children, children of war, find themselves in a classroom, a team that does not really understand what war is, so they may be bullied, they may be teased. We had a child here 
who was we traumatized because he went back to school, his father died at the front. He went back to school and the school and classmates pretended that nothing happened. Like it's better not to talk, they didn't say anything. Teachers, the whole school and classmates and the class teacher, everyone pretended that it hadn't happened. They just said hello, hello. Come in, Andrushka. Yes, and just remember that loss is perceived not only painfully as loss, death, but also the attitude of people who are important to you to this loss. How did the child react to this? He refused to go to school completely. What did he say? He literally said that my dad died among other things because he was protecting these children, my classmates and all these women who work at the school. He was defending the whole country. Why do they pretend that this doesn't exist? They have no respect, it means nothing to them. I'm sure that it was not because of disrespect, because people do not know how to express condolences. Instead of coming up and saying, we know that your father died, we're sorry, they close up and just say, Andre, hi. You can even remember him organize a memorial evening, if the child does not mind, because it was very important to him. You have to respect the people who protect you and who give their hearts and leaves for you so you leave and go to school. And it just became clear that it was not because of any disrespect, but because they did not know how. They didn't know how to approach, how to hug. Do you know what else I wanted? You have asked me to show you my lucky charm. Would you like to see it? Yes. It's a flag that's, you know, how old is it? What year did I get it for the first time? 2004. I got this flag and it was the first time I reached the top of Mont Blanc. It's my good luck charm. And now it also has your energy in it. I can pass it around. Have a look. Just don't burn it, please. I want another flag that will be no less valuable than this one. I want a flag with your autographs on it. Can I have it? Yes. They have pictures of their dead parents on their desk. It is extremely powerful and very personal. What I see is completely different generation. We have a chance now to raise the best generation in the history of this country, the generation that this country has long deserved. What will happen if we all pretend now that we only need drones? We need them. We need them now. We need the victory. We need to defend the borders of our country as well as the personal borders of our children. If we don't get them back in this war, it will be not enough to win this war. We all need to understand that they are fighting for our country and our borders, and we need to fight for the values they are defending there. Until February of 2024, I spent most of my life on expeditions to the most interesting, amazing and remote places in the world. Now, for the first time in my adult life, I have not crossed the border of Ukraine for two years, and I could not imagine that after all the emotions I have experienced all over the world, one of the most impressive for me would be a trip to a children's camp in the Carpathians, a trip that I remember almost every day. The children, their faces and voices will always be in my memory, and most importantly, the conclusions that I am sure all Ukrainians will share with me. The next decades of life in Ukraine will depend entirely on how children live and are brought up today during the Great War. And if the main emotions of today's children are only pain, fear and hate, this will be our future. However, if we show children that kindness, humanity and mutual assistance are, even during the war, for example, it will become the normal for future generations. Children, they must live their childhood as fully and joyfully as possible. And the task of adults is to ensure this for children even during the war. I was so impressed by this trip to the children that my team and I continue to explore the lives of children of war, and in the next episodes we will show you what each of us can do today to live in a dream country after the war, which will be built and developed by today's children. Thank you very much for this flag. Glory to Ukraine! Glory to the heroes! 
So, my friends, let's sing a Ukrainian song. And this will be our kind of memory of this evening in this video. Let's do it. Thank you! Thank you! Glory to Ukraine! Glory to the heroes! In the next episode... 50 meters from our house was the front line. The children saw and heard everything that could fly. They even heard a vacuum bomb being dropped. Heroic people who save the future of our country and devote their lives to foster children. It seems to me that I would have been lost long ago if it were not for my mom and dad. These are children, broken children. We need to fix it. My dad is in heaven, standing with this man. The love that fills children's hearts. They're frying and steaming something, making mayonnaise here, dumplings there, everything goes on. And so it goes on three times a day, such a frantic rush. And children's dreams that come true. What's in your dream? My heart is beating in secret in my ear. No one will hear. A dog. You have to be confident in your dreams. Let's go. A unique journey into the world of those who give true love and warmth. Who says from is another question. They save me or I save them. They rolled inside out with Dmitro Komarov, Ukraine.